Romans 11, 33 to 36, the Apostle Paul writes, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, if we take the book of Romans as a whole, and we wanted to break it up into two sections, the first section would be chapters 1 to 11, and the second section would be 12 to 16. Uh, as, the, as the Apostle Paul often does in his letters, he begins with theology. He begins with doctrinal teaching in the first part of his letter. And then at the end of his letter, he will have more practical application. He'll say, well, this is what we must believe. And based upon what we must believe, this is how we must live. And that's how you could break up the book of Romans. First 11 chapters have been theology, deep theology. And then when we get to chapter 12, he's going to start more dealing with more practical issues. And so right at the end, right at the end of, of the theological part, not that the rest is in theology, but you know what I mean, the doctrinal part of the letter, and we have seen a lot of things in, Ro in the first 11 chapters of Romans. We have dealt with total depravity, and we have dealt with justification, and we have dealt with sanctification, we've dealt with glorification, we've dealt with um, election and predestination, and we've talked about the law, and we've talked about the gospel, we've talked about perseverance of the saints, we've talked about eschatology, now, the resurrection on the last day, all these things we've dealt with so much. And the last thing that we saw last week, at the end of chapter 11, Paul was talking about how God has planned all history, in essence, to bring salvation to all nations. And all this theology causes the Apostle Paul to simply break out in praise at the end of chapter 11. Our passage today is what we call a doxology. Take it from the Greek word, doxa, which means glory or praise, doxologia. You know, after Paul has given us all this deep theology, and it's probably the, the deepest theology that you can find in all of the Bible, uh, and Paul does not boast in how awesome a Bible teacher he is, and how awesome a writer he is, though he is an amazing writer, and he is probably the greatest theologian that ever lived, but his point is not, well, look at all the stuff that I know. What he comes to is he wants to praise God for his greatness. So we're going to look at this doxology today. The first word in this doxology, in verse 33, is the word, Oh! <laughs> That's in the Greek, okay? Or, oh, Omega. Or, oh, it's in there. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cry. It's a, it's a, I don't know if it's a sigh or a groan. It shows passion. It shows emotion. Like, what he has just said is so incredible that he has to go, oh! There are some people who are very passionate and very emotional and loud and very active and they want to do stuff but their theology is very poor and they know very little and they don't have a lot to back up the reason they're doing what they're doing then on the other hand there are others who know a lot of theology who know a lot of stuff who know all the doctrines know all the difficult words but it may be somewhat Cold. It may be without passion or zeal. Well, the Apostle Paul is both. The Apostle Paul knows more theology than all of us, and he is more zealous and passionate than all of us. His belief and his behavior went together. So he is taking us as high as he can go theologically, and now he bows and worships. 
verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now, depending on your translation, you may have a slightly different first sentence. In the New King James that I'm using, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So it's the depth of riches of wisdom and knowledge. Um, Literally in the Greek, if I translate it for you literally in the Greek, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So there are different ways. We're not 100% sure how to translate it, but I think that is what he's doing. He's talking about the depths of three things. The riches of God, the wisdom of God, and the knowledge of God. And I think that's parallel to verses 33 and, sorry, 34 and 35, where it says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? That's the knowledge of God. Who has become his counselor? That's the wisdom of God. Who has first given to him? That's the riches of God. God has everything. God owns everything. So let's look at these things. But, the fir- but first of all, before we look at these three things, all three of these things, he says, are deep. Oh, the depths of God. When we read about God's attributes, when we read about who God is, we read them as deep. That means that there are things about God that you're never going to get to the bottom of. It's just too deep. There are things about God we cannot know. It's just too deep. Um, A few years ago, I had gone to the beach with some friends of mine, and we're sitting on the beach, and there was a little island about half a kilometer out, and we're like, let's swim over there. And we slowly swam over there. And as we're, first we're walking, and then it gets deeper, and you can see the bottom, and then as you're going along the way, you can't see the bottom anymore. And then as you're going, you dive down in to try and touch, you can't touch the bottom, you can't see the bottom, you're like, this, this is, I don't know where the, the bottom is. And then we got there, and then we came back, and when I checked, I, I got online to check to see how deep the area was. And it says it was 15 meters. And I was like, 15 meters? That's nothing. Then I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, that's far deeper than I usually swim. 15 meters could be like four or five story building. So imagine four or five stories, and you're up there. There's a lot of space between you and the bottom there. And then I was thinking about the ocean, where it goes down kilometers, 10 kilometers down. Where, you're, where it's just dark, because it's too deep. The light, it can't even get there. It's so deep. We can't even go to the bottom. We, we'll, we can't get submarines that low. You can't send little machines down there. It's just too, it's the 21st century, and we still can't get to the bottom of the ocean. That's how deep it is. Well, if the ocean is that deep, God is far greater. God is, all of creation is in him. So. God is far greater and far deeper than the ocean. So God is infinite and we are finite. So we could never fully know God. But, I mean, that's why, that's why in, verse, uh, in verse 33, in the middle, it says, How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It's too deep. Yet... In His grace, God has revealed certain things to us. We can know something. We can't know everything about God, but we can know some things for sure about God because He has revealed them to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, sorry, 2 verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So it's talking about how we can't even imagine the things of God that God has prepared and so forth. And usually that verse that I just read is used in like funerals 
and stuff like that. People will say, oh, we can't imagine what God has prepared for his people. But the next verse, verse 10, says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So that verse is saying there are things that are so deep. There are things that you can't even imagine. But some of them, at least, God has revealed to us. We can know some things about God if he tells us. If he doesn't, we can't. But he has revealed to his people a number of things for us to know him. So, even though we can't know everything about God, and that may seem frustrating on one hand, on the other hand, it could actually be quite exciting, because that means that you're never going to stop learning about God. You're never going to get to a point where you're like, all right, we're done. Okay, I understand God now perfectly. We're fine. No, I believe for all eternity, because even in heaven, even new heavens and new earth, we're still going to be creatures. I think even then, we will forever be knowing God better and learning more about Him because He is so deep. It goes forever. So, what are the three things that He mentions in verse 33 that are so deep? First, the riches of God. The depth of the riches of God. Well, God made everything. So God owns everything. So everything is his. That's how rich he is. Think of something. Well, it belongs to God. Anything that you can think of belongs to God. Uh, Genesis 1.1, we all know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, it's speaking about Christ as creator. And it says, for by him... All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So his point is, it's not just what you see. There's a spiritual world, there's a physical world, there's a spiritual world, there's angels, there's demons, there's heaven, there's hell, there's all these things that God has made. Everything has been made by God. And since everything was made by God... Everything belongs to him. That's why in verse 35 of our text, it says, Who has given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. Who has given, who has given anything to God that God would then owe him something? Oh, Nico gave me this, so I, I, I owe him. This verse here, you, you see it's actually a quotation. It's a quotation from Job. And in Job, he says, who is given to God that God would need to repay him for everything belongs to God. This, that's, the, that's the rest of the verse. Everything under heaven is God's. Let me read to you a verse from Acts 17. In Acts 17, the Apostle Paul came to Athens and he's speaking to the people at the Areopago. And he says this, because he sees all these people who are making their offerings to God, and they have all these temples and everything that they think are so holy. And he says to them, God, this is Acts 17, 24 and 25, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life breath, and all things. You can't give something to God that is not already His. You can't give to God something that He needs. He doesn't need anything from His creation. He's the one who gives. You can't give anything to Him that isn't already His. He made everything. In Psalm 50, there's this uh, interesting passage where God speaks, and, he's told, and this is what He says, Psalm 50, verses 9 to 12. God says, I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats of your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on the thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. 
If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. He's saying, if I wanted to eat something, not that God eats, but he's just saying how he doesn't need anything. And if he did need something, theoretically speaking, he says, I could just get one of the cattle from the thousand hills and eat it. It's fine. I could do- it's mine. Everything is mine anyway. There is nothing that exists that is not God's. So God's riches are deep. His riches are infinite. Anything you see in all of creation is God's. Second, in verse 33 again, we have the depths of the riches of God and we have the depths of the knowledge of God. A lot of people who think they're quite smart and yes, perhaps compared to other humans, they maybe have a higher IQ or something like that, but our knowledge of things is severely limited. Compared to God, we are but a drop in the ocean. In 1 John 3.20, it says God knows everything. I don't have it over there. That's the sentence. That's the text. God knows everything. God knows everything about everything. In Hebrews 4.13, the writer to the Hebrews says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The one to whom we must give account is God. And everything in all of creation is open and naked in front of him. You cannot hide anything from God. He knows and sees everything. God doesn't just see everything. God knows the future. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46 verses 9 to 10. Isaiah says, well, God says through the prophet, Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. From the beginning, God tells us what's going to happen. He decrees it, it will happen. God knows everything. God knows what's going to happen in the future. God even knows... What could happen under, un, under different circumstances? God knows what would happen in every possible situation. Let me, give you, let me read you a couple of verses, quite interesting, from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 11. Uh, this is where Jesus is, after having done many miracles and many great works and much great preaching towards certain cities in Galilee... Uh, those cities are Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. He accuses them because they have not repented and not believed in him. And he says this. This is Matthew 11, verse 21. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin. That's the city. Woe to you, Bethsaida. That's another city in, in Galilee. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Then he says in verse 23, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So he is saying, this is how bad Capernaum is. If, if, I, if Jesus had gone to Sodom and, done, and preached there and done the miracles that he had done there, the people in Sodom would have repented. And Sodom would not have been destroyed. Now that didn't happen. Jesus didn't go there. And they didn't repent. And they were destroyed. But he's saying, if this had happened, then this would have happened. God knows everything. He knows the future. He knows what could have happened if we did this, but instead did that. He knows every possible situation. There is nothing that God doesn't know. Which is incredible. I mean, (laughs) God knows everything. He has always known everything. He will always know everything. God has never learnt anything. Because if God learned something, that would mean that before he learnt it, 
he didn't know everything. Right? And God can't forget anything, because that would mean that he doesn't know everything now. God has always known everything. That's the kind of God that we have. (laughs) No wonder Paul is saying the depth of the knowledge of God. We can't fathom these things. We can't get to the bottom of these things. That's why I think in verse 34, he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Our minds can't comprehend the greatness of God's mind. The fact that you could go to God right now and say, Hey, how many stars are there in the universe? And he knows. He could give you the number. He could give you their names. You go to God and say, How much sand is on the beaches? On the... He knows. He knows. He knows what you're thinking right now. He, he knows what every one of you is thinking right now. He knows what every one of eight billion people in the world are thinking right now. He knows what you're going to be thinking tomorrow. You don't even know what you're going to be thinking tomorrow. And God knows. God's knowledge is <laughs> deep. The third thing that he praises God for, or when he speaks of the depths of God, is the wisdom of God. In verse 33, of the depth of the wisdom of God. Wisdom and knowledge, they're not the same thing. They're related, but they're not the same thing. Wisdom is not simply knowing a lot of stuff. Wisdom is knowing what to do with all the stuff that you know. Wisdom is about making right decisions. Wisdom is having a good purpose, a good goal, finding good means to get to the goal, making right choices, making good decisions. This is what wisdom is about, not messing things up. Why do we keep, why do we make plans and things don't work out? Because, well, we're not God, we don't have all the information, we don't have all the wisdom. God created everything wisely and he does everything wisely he has a good and holy purpose goal end in everything that he does his purpose ultimately is his glory and the good of his people we all know romans 8 28 if you don't know it learn it what does it say i don't have to look it up (laughs) no i'll read it just so i don't get it wrong and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God is working all things and he's working them together for good according to his purpose. He has a wise purpose and a wise way to bring good to his people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, There's a fascinating passage, very interesting passage, I love it. And it's talking about how the world through its wisdom did not know God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he's talking about how those who, um, all, all the people in the world, all the philosophers in the world, all the wise men of the world, all the counselors of the world could not come to know God. All the wisdom of the world could not solve the biggest problem that man had. And the biggest problem that man had was sin. All the philosophers in the world didn't know how to, couldn't come to know God through their wisdom. But then he says, it was through the foolishness of preaching. And foolishness is, he's being sarcastic. Through the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel, God chooses to save his people. The world thinks that it's foolish. You're going to be saved through a man dying on a cross and through the preaching of his death on the cross and resurrection. Yes, that is how. And he gets to verse 25, 1 Corinthians 25, and he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That means... As you can get the wisest person in the world 
And even if God was an absolute fool, which doesn't make any sense, but if he were, he would still be much wiser <laughs> than the wisest person that exists. And this also means that there are going to be many times, since God's ways are above our ways and we can't fathom them and his wisdom, that means that there are going to be many times in our life when things happen where we don't understand why, but God knows why. And that's why we have to trust him. Because we're not going to know what God is doing as he is working in the lives of 8 billion men and 8, 8, 8 billion people. But God knows what he is doing. In verse 34, again, what does it say? Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? You know what? There's a lot of people who believe in the existence of God, but they don't think that God does a good job. They believe that there is a God, of course, but he should do things differently. And everyone wants to be God's counselor and tell him how to do things because things would work out better if we just followed their advice. In the book of Job, things have gone badly for Job. He has lost everything. And as the book goes on, Job starts getting upset with God. He starts... Uh, getting frustrated with God. And he starts demanding of God that God answer him. He says, God has to tell me why he's doing what he's doing. He must explain himself to me. I want answers from God. Because if Job was God, he would do things differently. And God appears. <laughs> and God says, you want answers, Job? You answer me first. I have some questions for you before you go asking me questions. And he says, Job, where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I created mountains? Where were you when I created the oceans? Where were you when I created clouds? Where were you, Job? Do you, Job, know how to make a star? Do you know how to make an animal? Do you know how to make the sun, moon, and stars? Do you know how to bring rain down or snow? Can you, do you know anything about these things, Job? It's like, uh, where were you, Job, when I created all of these things and made all these things work? I, I didn't exist. Oh, so maybe Job isn't as clever and as wise as he thought he was compared to God. And he says, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. God knows all things, and God knows the best way to deal with any situation because he is deep in wisdom. And that's why we need to trust him even when we don't understand what's going on, that God knows what's going on. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. If we live by sight, we're going to see everything around us falling apart and we're going to be like, I, I don't know how to deal with this. But we have to live by faith that God knows what he's doing because his wisdom is deep. And what's the conclusion in verse 36 of our text? Verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. We need to write this verse on, our, on the wall. That one verse right there, verse 36 we could say that this is the history of the world. Or we could say this is the, the story of your salvation. All things are of him and through him and to him. To whom be glory forever. All things are of him. God created the universe out of nothing. There was a time when there was nothing except God. And anything that you see, anything that you know, anything else that exists came from Him. 
In Psalm 33, Psalm 33, verses 6 and then verse 9, it says this, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. God spoke, and worlds were created. Everything is of him, from him. Psalm 90, verse 2, says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. All things, anything that you see, anything that exists, is of him. And we are told, everything is through him. I think this is talking about how all things depend upon God for their continued existence. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, he talks about how God is the one who upholds all things. Literally, he carries all things. Feri, uh, In Colossians chapter 1, it speaks of Christ as creator. And he says, and it says, in Christ, all things hold together. If Jesus decided to stop upholding the universe, the universe would stop existing in a second. Everything would just disappear. Gone. Everything would fall apart. Everything is of him, and everything is through him, and everything is to him. What that means is what he says at the end, to whom be glory forever. Everything is, has God at its end. Everything is for him, in essence. Everything is going in the direction that will bring glory to God. All things that are created and all things that are through him, everything that exists and everything that is being sustained is for the glory of God. All of creation has been made for the glory of God. Revelation chapter 4 says this. You, verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Everything has been created so that God would get the glory. In Isaiah 43, God speaks to his people and he says, I made you for my glory. All things are of him and through him. And to him. He's the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between. To him be glory, Paul says, forever. So here we are. I know that was a rush through those verses. There's so much that we could talk about and so many texts we could look at. But what do we learn? We have a God who is rich, who is wise who is powerful, and he created us all with a purpose. And that purpose is to bring glory to him. That is why we are here. And let me say this, all of us, every single human being who has ever lived, will bring glory to God in one way or another. There are some who will bring glory to God unwillingly, as they are forced to to kneel on the last day and acknowledge that he is Lord and will be cast into hell for the glory of God's righteousness and justice and wrath and others who willingly will bow the knee to Christ, those who have had their hearts changed to the glory of his grace and mercy. All of us will bring glory to God in the end. So what do we do now? What do we do now? And that's what Paul is going to do. In the next verse, chapter 12, he's going to say, well, what should we do now? He's going to say that we should live our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In 1 Corinthians, it says, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether you're eating or drinking, things that may seem mundane, things that may seem simple that you don't even think about, everything you do in your life should be Focused 
on bringing glory to God. So let us pray that God would help us to live lives that are pleasing to him and that we may be living sacrifices to him. Let's pray.